We're recording. My guest this morning is Professor Muli Peleg, who is teaching here at Rutgers University in the Political Science Department. Uh, he's also a professor at Columbia University and is a peace activist uh, in um, the Israeli and, and wider context. And he is uh, here to share with us his expertise as a political scientist on the election results, uh, to share that um, with, with all of us. So thank you very much for, for doing this. And let me begin by asking if you would give us the one-minute version of how Israeli political parties, it's not the same as an election in the United States. Tell us. No, uh, no. one of the uh, major uh, factors uh, which underpin the uh, Israeli elections is voting for lists not for individuals, not for name, but for list of parties. And these are proportional elections that are supposed to represent all factions. This is an immigrant society. It was very important for the forefathers of the Israeli state, the Israeli polity, that all sections will be represented. Therefore, we got a very rather fragmentary uh, Knesset or parliament, Israeli parliament. But this is uh, because of the principle, not because of the effectiveness of how politics should work. Now, there's none of these, in the United States there are huge restrictions. You want to try to start a third party, even if you have millions of dollars like Ross Perot, right. it's very hard to get anywhere. It must be pretty easy to start a party. I mean, didn't this, uh, he yes. wasn't a comedian, but, but whatever, the entertainer who said, no, I'm going to be a politician this year, he suddenly gets the second most, uh, his, his party gets the second most votes. This couldn't happen in America, it'd be impossible. So no, very democratic. because I'm telling you, the, uh, the mood uh, shifts very easily in Israel. Um, the political system operates in a very precarious and very volatile framework. So most Israelis uh, uh, vote uh, as a protest vote. They know who to vote against, but they're not sure who to vote for. So every now and then we have this phenomenon of a political party coming out of nowhere with promises and with nice faces and they get like 15 seats in the Knesset and then the next elections they disappear. So yes, Atid, we have a future with Yair Lapid is the case in this round and he exceeded all expectations by getting 19 mm -hmm. seats in the parliament. That's amazing. But is there, I'm a specialist in Italian uh, history and even modern politics and one of the things you could understand about Italy was that things constantly changed, but they never did. Right. Uh, really from 1945 until the 1990s, it was always the center, Christian Democrats, very gradually moving a little bit left, but never very far left. And um, so my understanding of Israeli results is, well, for a long time, Labor won, they coalesced with this or with that, but they always won, and now they don't win, and much more often what we call the right, and I want you to try to explain for us students what, what right means. I don't think it means the same thing as Republican Party in the United no, States. No, no. So maybe you want to clarify that, and then tell us whether there is some underlying stability in all of this. So is my sensibility at all correct here? About yeah. Well, right and left are very volatile and very flu uh, futile and fluid uh, terms, and it changes with every political system. With regard to Israel, Everything leans towards the major cleavage or fault line, and this is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Right means intransigent to intransigence towards uh, any kind of an agreement with the Palestinians or give, giving away territories, and left means reconciliation and giving the territories back in some form or shape. Um, this is different than economically left and right or uh, philosophically re left and right. Now, when we talk about left and right with the context of Israel, it's not really ideologically uh, put. The people that vote for the right or the more strong stance vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians have not read any uh, ideological material of the right wing of uh, revisionism or of Jabotinsky, which was the uh, inspirational figure of the ideological right. I think their vote is motivated basically by uh, fear or mistrust of the Palestinians, and oddly enough, it's exactly the same on the Palestinian side, whereby the right or intransigence vis-a-vis -vis Israelis or a settlement with Israelis is motivated by fear and lack of trust of Palestinians uh, in the Israelis' eyes. So uh, it's kind of a symmetry that entrenched the conflict by voting hawks to the uh, helm 
or positions of power on both sides. Now, the, another axis that I'm familiar with in a very secondary sense is the split between secular, I'll call it, and religious, or deeply religious, or orthodox. That, that's a, a different split in some ways. Could you be deeply orthodox and still be in favor of talking to the Palestinians, or that's not what happens? Well, the question's loaded, I realize. No, no, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, we have in Israel a model of uh, uh, sociologists call it reinforcing cleavages. Unlike cross-cutting cleavages, all fault lines are sucked into one another and amplify one another. So religious, uh, on average, I'm generalizing now, but on average in Israel, tend to be uh, more hawkish. They don't want to give territories away, not because of strategic reasons, uh, political reasons, or military reasons, but because of religious reasons and traditional reasons, because they see the territories as the land of the forefathers. Now, they have been relatively dormant until 1967. The swift victory, six days in 1967, June 1967, awakened the religious parties in Israel, the political religious parties in Israel, because they saw this victory as a divine intervention, mm -hmm. as a sign of God that uh, the uh, return of the Messiah is around the corner. And this galvanized them and activate their political ambitions. Now, with regard to their position in the Israeli map, they managed to uh, clinch the uh, tipping of the balance position and they were the uh, they crowned the next government in Israel we need to have a coalition government because the parliament is so fragmentary no single party can form a government they need coalition partners and the religious was were always there in the middle partners potentially for the block of the right and the block of the left uh, block as well they wanted whatever each of the, of the blocks can uh, promise them. And they always got it because they were the safe partner for a solid coalition. And this situation continued until the 1990s. And then it somewhat changed because of the major immigration of Russian Jews. And all in all, uh, about a million and a half Russian Jews emigrated. And they were a very unified and solid constituency with regard to their political opinions, with their political stand, especially vis-a-vis -vis the Arabs. To whom they are opposed to politics. Yes. Okay. They are considered to be in this uh, spectrum that we constructed earlier, hawkish. They are hawks. They are, uh, their mistrust of the Arabs is salient, and they go for strong Israel and larger Israel. So because of their numbers, they clinch this middle position uh, and tipping the balance of uh, who's going to be the next uh, prime minister. And uh, their leader uh, became uh, um, Lieberman, um, Victor Lieberman, which was now the uh, foreign minister. And he's still uh, a very major partner of the uh, right-wing coalition. So we'll see how things go now, because they are just started the negotiation about the new coalition in mm -hmm. Israel. Now, some people in the Knesset cannot be part of any coalition, right? I mean, isn't it, again, I go back to Italy because I know, you couldn't, neo-fascists could not possibly be part of anybody's government. So the bigger they got, the more you didn't have 120 seats or in Italy, right. 600 seats, but 630 seats. But anyway, so there are people that are beyond the spectrum of possibly being in the government. Now, this would be the, the, the Arab yeah. part, and clarify for me. So, so the, these Arabs are citizens, but then they're Muslim. They are Arabs. It doesn't, it doesn't matter their religion. Uh, Arabs are Israeli citizens, and they have uh, full uh, equality, and uh, they have full rights. However, they are being turned by the political parties in Israel, not Arabs, but uh, non-Zionists. Okay. And this is the key. This is the indicator. And so they're like my neo-fascists in Italy. You can't allow. Well, that is analogy. That the, the analogy is, is apt. Um, but the Zionist parties in Israel, uh, the leading parties on the right and on, and on the and on center, not the left so much, Meretz, which is the left party, the, the civil rights party, never declared that they, they don't see the Arabs as partners. But the right wing, of course, but also, unfortunately, from my uh, perspective, Yair Lapid and the centrist uh, new party, with all the hope, he just declared a week ago that he cannot see himself forming a blocking 
um, um, group to uh, pro uh, to prevent uh, Netanyahu from getting the uh, right. the job with the Arab parties. They are illegitimate in his eyes, or definitely in the right wing uh, eyes, because they are not partners to the Zionist ethos and vision of the country of Israel. Um, is it the case, and we have this little chart here that the students will have available, only if it helps uh, to, uh, to get any <laughs> sense of anything. So I'm looking at 31 plus 19, and I'm figuring that's where things have to go at first, right? Tell us as a political scientist your best judgment of where it goes next. We don't, unfortunately, this silly chart doesn't tell me who's <laughs> the religious bodies, who's which I get mixed up. Yeah, nice colors, though. Yeah. Here's the situation. Um, the uh, head of the party that got uh, most of the votes is not automatically the candidate to form a new government. The candidate is appointed by the president of Israel, Shimon Peres. Who is case. labor. Yes. Right? Yes, but now he's neutral. Uh, he's well, hovering the president, you have to yes, become yes. neutral. Okay. He represents the entire Israeli the Queen of England populace. Is. Yes. Queen of England. That, I'm not sure he's going to like <laughs> this I know, I know, I know. <laughs> um, but uh, he's going to appoint the candidate that is perceived to have the most chances of putting together a coalition government. Uh, in the previous elections, Netanyahu was appointed, even though uh, he wasn't the one who received most of the vote. Right. It was T.P. Livni from the Kadima party who got more votes than him, but because of his uh, affiliations and connections with his uh, putative uh, partners to the coalition, he got the green light and he indeed managed to put together a coalition. This case is very interesting because we have roughly the same uh, number in the right and the left blocks because of Yair Lapid and the new uh, uh, call and the new party. But still, um, the uh, candidate has most chances of receiving the green light from the president next week is Netanyahu, nevertheless, because he's got has already established alliances with the right and with the religious parties. Whereas the center and the left is still uh, disorganized and they haven't made any progress in tr trying to put together an alliance for uh, making uh, either Yair Lapid or the leader of the Labour Party, Shelly Yachimovich, a viable candidate to put together a government. Mm -hmm. But is it your sense that this is going to be inherently a, a weak government? Again, what I know is that the government sort of couldn't solve the problem of what the uh, Orthodox men should serve in the military. They don't seem to be able to figure out any way that they're willing to talk to the Palestinians. It doesn't look to me as if there's a coalition that's going to move either. Though I would assume the religious parties are not in favor of forcing the Orthodox to serve. Or, or well, no, no. Right. Well, we assume. have to distinguish here between the religious Zionist parties who serve in the military and act as regular citizens. They have a long-term vision of turning the country into a theocratic country. Uh, ruled by the spirit of, of religion, uh, but uh, they take part, uh, they participate in uh, regular uh, citizenry uh, life in Israel, whereas the Orthodox Jews try to isolate themselves. They do take part in the budget allocation, but they do not serve in the military, okay. and most of them don't work, but they study the Torah. So these are two different groups. However, vis-a-vis -vis their common challengers or common opponents, they can form one coalition. Yayu Lapid, which runs with a secular agenda and sharing the burden, is a common shared uh, menace, a challenge to them. Uh, Yayu Lapid strives for a secular government, together with uh, Netanyahu's Likud. So to prevent this and to derail this intention, they go together, even though they don't like one another. So these are contingencies, these are expediencies, and everybody tries to survive not in the opposition. Opposition in Israeli politics is an abomination. Just sitting there and having some speeches and raise your hands is not enough. You have to be on the operating side, the sides with the budget, the side that can carry weight. And then you can also guarantee your re-elections because you get the money for it. What should our students be looking for over the next few weeks, those that are interested in this topic more than they were? And what, 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 do they, what do they want to watch? I don't want to get you into the position of predicting the outcome. Well, it's going to be but, interesting. But That's the issue. Never a dull moment. Because it's going to be a lot of bickering, a lot of accusation, acrimonious dialogue, pulling and howling. This might be one attempt, and then this attempt might fail. The, the first appointee has 90 days to form a government. 
I don't think that will work in this case because it's too close and the blocks are too uh, equal in their numbers and in their weight. So I won't rule out uh, a first attempt and then a second attempt. Maybe uh, the president uh, will appoint somebody else to try to form a government. But nevertheless, it's going to be very tight and very fragile. And you're right, I don't see any stability in the next term. And I doubt it if the next government is going to uh, last for the whole four years. Probably not. We, how fast can it collapse? Are there rules about how long they have to do it? There are no, give up after 90 no, days? Whenever you it, vote, uh, if, when, it, when you have a confidence vote in, in, the, in, the, in the government, it can fall immediately. So I don't see it even uh, last for a whole year. Because everything is so fragile, so precarious. Not only the structure of the fragmentary government, it's everything that happens around it. For example, if, if uh, Netanyahu manages to, uh, manages to put together a government, but doesn't start any initiative vis-à-vis -vis the Palestinians, okay. I predict uh, an explosion. This cannot stay idle like this. Uh, there is a lot of discontent on the Palestinian side, but also there's a lot of social protests inside Israel, which is one of the major reasons why Yair Lapid was catapulted to the position he managed to uh, achieve now, 19 seats. It's an unprecedented achievement. You think that we ought to interpret that as it being in favor of some dialogue with the Palestinians rather than economic issues? Or both. Both. People abhor the status quo and they want to see some change and Israelis and they prefer to see it initiated by the Israelis and not by somebody else, the Arabs or uh, somebody else from outside, the third oh, time intervener, yeah. for example, yes. <laughs> and then they'll have to react. So they want Israel to initiate, and in the previous government, they thought that Netanyahu was manacled by an extreme right-wing coalition, which now they hope it will be much more moderate to allow, to allow Netanyahu to uh, start some initiatives. Is there some possibility that Labour and uh, Lapid and uh, Netanyahu's group, I mean, that would be a lot more than 60? Well, we have a problem with uh, the Labour leader, Shelley Netanyahu, uh, announcing uh, a couple of days before the election that she would never join such a government. That but she was, but she was related, that's right, not very <laughs> political and not very savvy, but uh, she was referring to the previous coalition. Such coalition we would never join. However, if there's going to be a new coalition with uh, Yair Lapid and with Tipe Livni and other moderate factors, she might change and politicians can change their minds because they always find the right excuse for it. So I do see some shimmering light of hope. Now, this is a judgmental call on sure. my part. But if there is a government that would allow the Prime Minister to go forward and initiate talks with the Palestinians and also start implementing some of the social reforms, Israel will be better off than it was in the last couple of years. Can you recommend... Um news sources or uh, internet media is even better that our students who want to follow this closely should uh, be looking at other you know I said New York Times you trust them but uh, well, their analysis is not always well as there deep is an Israeli, an Israeli paper that has also a website which is called Haaretz Haaretz okay I have that on for the students definitely and that's definitely. a good one to follow yes, absolutely can you can you place for us where it leans if that's what we have to be concerned with I, I don't mind it could be left it could be right center right. left Center yes, left. Yes. Okay. Yes. But it's counterbalancing, it, counterbalancing all the other, uh, most of the Israeli newspapers and media sources which uh, go with the government and hence they were, you know, leaning towards the right so far. Okay, see, I, I need stuff that's in English. And no, that's when, an English when, English yeah, okay, when we do with your North Africa, I tell the students well, you ought to be looking at Al Jazeera, it seems right. to me like. Yeah, and Jerusalem Post stuff. as well. Jerusalem Post yes. is okay, yes. too. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, because they can, uh, students don't read physical paper, newspaper anymore, right. everything's yeah. internet, yeah. And, uh, but that's okay, I mean, if you have it on your favorites. Yeah. RS Jerusalem Post, and occasionally go into the uh, website of the Knesset, of the Israeli parliament, to get some raw numbers and some uh, dry facts, I would also... Do, do they have a transmit, um, live debates yes, and discussions, absolutely. is that something yes. you could... Uh, yeah, in the English parliament, yes, okay. yes, they do, they, they do that quite often. Okay. It's interesting to see that. Well, for the students who are able to follow it. Yes, uh, there's a lot of commotion. Yeah, it's so just the body language. It's just yeah, shouting. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's entertainment. Good. Okay. Thank you so much. This has been a great pleasure. I appreciate it enormously. Great. Okay, Jerry.